My name is Carlos Pataro. I am the MFA Program Director and the co-publisher of Philadelphia Stories. Many of you were here with us for the day for the Lit Life uh, Poetry Conference, which was really fantastic. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, for those of you who are part of Lit Life, uh, it was spectacular. We had the best attendance we've ever had. It's a terrific day of panels and workshops, and uh, it culminates with this. I just wanted to say thank you and welcome to everyone on behalf of Rosemont College and of uh, Philadelphia Stories and the Montgomery County Poet Laureate Organization. I want to say some serious words about Sandy Crimmins, um, whom we honor at Philadelphia Stories with this prize. She was one of the first people we published. She was in our very first issue of poetry called Spring, which I have taught uh, in my classes, uh, which I love uh, to this day. Sandy was one of our performers at our launch party, where she performed with um, all kinds of fun people. She did things with fire baton twirlers and all kinds of stuff. She was a real performance artist. Um, and she was someone who really uh, ignited in me, and I think I can speak for Christine as well, um, a better and more fuller understanding of what poetry can accomplish. Um, I think Christine and I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn by saying that we were both probably, especially back in 2005 when we launched this magazine, a little bit poetry phobic. And um, Christine's father, who was our first uh, poetry editor, um, and Sandy were, were good buddies, and I think sometimes clashed a little bit, but that just made the poetry all the much better in a, on the pages of our magazine. Um, I'm honored and thrilled to be able to introduce um, Sandy's partner, um, Joe Sullivan, who makes this prize possible. He's going to come say a few words. And um, again, we're just very, very honored um, to be able to participate and do this again every year. So please welcome Joe Sullivan. I really can't improve upon what Carla said. Sandy lived for not only poetry, but for mentoring. She was a mentor to many other aspiring short story writers and poets. And um, so the reason I decided after she passed away suddenly uh, to um, support this award and this prize is because that's what she would have done. Mm -hmm. She would have said, you know, what can I do if I, go, if I leave this world, what can I do? And I know what her answer would be. It would be support other creative artists. Mm -hmm. And that's what the award is designed to do. And congratulations. I've already reviewed the magazine. It's terrific, as always. But uh, it's a great group of people. And um, congratulations to all of you. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. The magazine means so much to me, and this prize is always an incredible opportunity to uh, enlarge our community. And as you can see, that community continues <laughs> to grow and grow and grow. And we're going to start talking a little bit more about the uh, individual poets. There is something consistent across the board that I could say about them. It would be that they uh, were all extremely inventive in their approach, in the way they entered their subject. Um, and very and very concise as well. Um, so, so they were striking, like on the first reading, they were very striking. Um, and then the the winning poem, which is called "Elegy for Breath." Um, what a, a little bit of what I said was. Um, the winning poet puts fragmented testimony, restrained lineation, shifting tones, and layered imagery to the service of an unrelenting, traumatic subject matter. And, uh, and I also added that the poem haunts our very own breathing with a question, both mournful and matter of fact. How much in the USA does breathing inside a human black body redefine from birth to death? Thank you very much, and congratulations to the winners. Elegy for Breath. Picture the adolescent, mimicking what makes him worthy. Pick his most potent snapshot for clickbait. Fresh-faced, but mean muggy. Same mask I pull clean across my jaw for any Polaroid of me and my best friend in eighth grade. 
Let's be clear. Choke stance. Now used to justify killing. Make just the just snuffed, just clumsy youth, branded, bold fonted, and bloodthirst. Peace sign. Transmogrified to gang sign. Since the expert talking head confirmed it. The expert talks and confirms inside a rectangular frame that renders most of him invisible. Talks and confirms. Two bullet points from the Bleach Teeth interviewer. But nowhere is the testimony of breath stifled. The practiced hands that remain watched whenever they ascended whether in prayer or surrender, holding a bag of groceries, a cell phone, or a son. Nowhere is that last sigh free from his tired lungs as the sixth shot struck the base of his skull, sprinting with back turned. The neighbor describes that final sound I did not hear and yet cannot unhear. It is suddenly the last sound I hear from too many people I love. My brother-in-law, my four nephews, my high school best friend, my infant son. Every police officer is out in the world defending himself. Every one of them describes the nightmares in which they see a dark object against the darkness that turns into fire and populates a rigid void with lead. Every police officer is a human being. He makes mistakes sometimes. He got nervous. He thought about his two kids and his pregnant wife. It was 14 days before retirement. He's never missed a Sunday at church. Believe me, it's true. I've seen him pass the donation plate. Sometimes. He takes a naked, crumpled bill in his calloused hands, wipes the sweat and residue on his crotch. I saw Jesus on Easter Sunday, still resting on the wall, a hooded sweatshirt draped across his torso from the college he was to attend, just to make it all a bit more decent. Everything you stare into becomes a fist, a loaded weapon aimed at your face. I wake up in a country based on a single document made to protect every human being equally, who is a wealthy white man, the woman, I meet after my show in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, has no response when I ask her why the killing of three dogs made her protest, made her write letters, made her boycott, while the murder of a defenseless black child inspired not a single word from her lips, loud music blocking the middle of an empty residential street, a wallet in a trembling outstretched palm, a back sprinting away in fear, a woman after a car accident, knocking on a door for help, a toy rifle in a Walmart in Ohio, a boy in Money, Mississippi, walking lost in thought, a stutter from polio, a whistle he learned to cope with his stammer when the implication of blackness is always absolution for murder. My son's first breath was withheld. The cord that had nourished him for nine months now choked three times around his throat as he fought for life. Like his sister at birth. Like the father on a sidewalk in Staten, selling cigarettes to support his six kids to survive, born fighting, stayed fighting to breathe. <clears throat> when my son gasped finally and then slumbered into dream, his blooming tenderness unguarded as a single orchid, I said a silent prayer for the imagined crimes his world was busy inventing to condemn him for being born black and having the courage 
to breathe. Sterner has been reading poems since childhood. She holds a BFA in poetry from Emerson College and an MS in Arts Administration from Drexel University. And her storytelling research has been published in the Journal of Arts Management, Law, and Society. She currently serves as the Director of Programming for One Book, One Philadelphia, a project of the Free Library of Philadelphia. Help me welcome Brittany. Here are feet on the floor of a plane over Omaha. Here are swatches of ground turning into ground. Here is voicemail from an unknown number. Here is every computer generated test. Here is waiting with glass. Here is middle night. Here are four heads touching. Here are hands in space. Here is rope. Here is the braid that makes the rope. Here is a death one day. Here is another death. Here is another death. Here is perched investment. Here are plot equations from above. Here are characters for land and love. Here is unstoppable weather. Here is a bowl of ocean. Here is food digesting. Here is the top of the bottom. Here is morning again. Here is wake with a ship on the tongue. Here is a mouth of fog. Here are rotaries of birds. Here beads traffic in rosaries. Here graves imitate trees in rows. Here is orchard. Here is fruit clung and hatched. Here is a basket. Here are hands applied over Omaha braiding highways. Here lawns cropped in rectangles. Here tillers in bunches transit. Here an accident that didn't make news. Here clipped migration. Here is lamp on a timer. Here letters spell electricity. Here's the room after leaving. Here's the light going off. My friend invites me to death class Thursday evenings with Rabbi Linda, who says the departure time to the end of the funeral is for holding only what they would have wanted. No one speaks until a mourner cues there is no right ritual. Many are practicing now across the state. We say 11 names Thursday. In the Kaddish, I learn even for the wretched. Rabbi Linda says, Anunuits will close, then comforts of mourning come. Paramount to honor the body, a pitcher that held fine wine. Equalize each token, flowerless in a wire basin, and accept one who is dead, not be made to look alive. I learn tradition cues ground, sheet, earth, as soon as possible. Nothing fancy holes in cardboard bottom give expedient return. All the buried are known brothers and sisters in pants, metal removed, feet sewed to themselves. Bodies a question of permanence, of sanctity, dust, a question of living with ashes. Rabbi Linda wonders if cremation is really a rejection of the resurrection. Classmates say, if scattering in the bay, be sure the tide is going out. If scattering internationally, Santorini and Israel. If scattering have pie and champagne, take a cruise together with the remains of one who struggles with God. Whatever you want, Rabbi Linda says, since may be fable to be buried ready and sitting up. Still, slip knots for when the Messiah comes. She says we never know why we do these things, really only that our bodies have ways of ending. The government has suggested weaponizing places of worship. On Thursday, Rabbi Linda reads to us, to anyone who walks in open-handed, from pages going backward, from this planet regenerated by absorbing all the buried strangers. 
was the 2017 Poet Laureate of Montgomery County and is a founding member of the No River Twice Poetry Improv Troupe. He's also the poetry editor of Ovunque Siamo, New Italian American Writing, and co-founder of the Sejura Poetry Festival. Uh, Chad's been published in various journals, including Decomp, Barrel House, Rust and Moth, and Mobius, the Journal of Social Change, uh, as well as featured on the radio program The Poet and the Poem, hosted by Grace Cavallari in association with the Library of Congress. So let's welcome Chad Frank. This is a nine-year-old boy named Jamel Miles who committed suicide in Colorado. Um, this story is from uh, August 28, 2018 at the Washington Post. I'm just going to read an excerpt. Um, before Jamel Miles died, he said that kids at his Colorado elementary school had told him to commit suicide, his mother said. Jamel's mother, uh, Leah Pierce, told um, KDVR that her nine-year-old son had told her he was gay and that when he returned to school from summer break, he wanted to come out to his peers. On Thursday, days after Jamel started the fourth grade at jo uh, Joe Schumacher Elementary School, police responded to a medical incident at his Denver area home and rushed him to a hospital where he was pronounced dead. Denver police said Monday in a statement to the Washington Post. Although the circumstances surrounding Jamel's death remain unclear, police said the medical examiner ruled his death a suicide. Jamel's no mother told KDVR that she believes that her son killed himself in part because he was bullied at school, and she wants to raise awareness about how damaging it can be, damaging it can be to a child's self-esteem. I'm just sad he didn't come to me, she told the statement about her son's, station about her son's suicide. I'm so upset that he thought that was his option. So this is nine-year-old suicide in reverse for Jamel Miles. A candle unsnuffs, its smoke drawn back in, its guttering finger-width flame relit. The bright blue Jansport rises from the floor and hooks its straps around your slight shoulders. You dart backwards down the carpeted stairs. The door unslams. The yellow bus backs up around the cul-de-sac. Your eyes unclench. The children suck words back away from you. High-fletched F, its bulbless semi-quaver. Lofty A, its slopes unassailable. Self-same, clickish GG, backs turned to shun. Surprised O, rolling, caught up in all this. And T, the final burning cross of it. That morning, unknowing, your mother smiles untussles your hair like wind smoothing grass and sits. Inky clouds of coffee billow past her pursed lips like possessing spirits. Outside, it's scarcely my 16th winter, pacing the drive, unsure what's led here. Hours of typing, the heyday of dial-up chat rooms, a torso photo, a phone call to calm my jangling nerves. Me out the door, you on your way to pick me up. Only the sparse, dead trees, thinning hair on the hilltop's scalp, are watching when your car rattles to a stop, your cracked face an old catcher's mitt slowly catching fire within, spewing cigarette smoke. Terrified, more of backing out than anything, I creak the door open and climb inside. We go. Later that night, I am retching in the bathroom when my mother comes home from work. I do not tell anyone there are parts of me that will never shake free, never be grown out of or eased into, will never be the same again because they do not come from me. This day I have learned to swallow more than you, more than pride or coke straight from the two liter bottle to cleanse the taste. The hardest thing to swallow is the idea that there will be no second chance at a first time. Persephone, trapped in winter, aching for spring, must realize because she swallows her captor's seed, she can never feel the sun. Her mother's plain face bearing the promise of flowers. Thanks. Kimberly Kiyoge Andrews uh, is a poet and literary critic. She is the author of A Brief History of Fruit, winner of the 2018 Akron Prize for Poetry and forthcoming from University of Akron Press. And between, winner of the 2017 New Women's Voices Prize from Finishing Line Press. She lives in Maryland and teaches at Washington College, and you can find her on Twitter. Her handle is in the magazine. Uh, and here she comes. <laughs> Thank you, Kimberly. How to read Whitewater in the Mid-Atlantic region. Here's the gift, the undetermined, toothy space in which it bubbles up crazily, thrashing around and telling you incessantly about the nature of possibility. 
These terrible courtships, in other words, you've had with rivers, their greenish syntax letting all the silk slip to the floor. Susquehanna, Lehigh, Yakagani, their stolen clauses, the low trees trailing their fingers as if to say, there now, river, there now. And in the little canoe, you sound out each line in turn. This is the side of you that is full of eagles. The story unfolds in several keenly observed parts, eddies in their indecision, standing waves like stacks of letters, each signed fondly. Undercut rocks against which the water boils low and smooth, dangerous in the same way that simplicity is dangerous. You read for answers because the painted ceiling above you demands a key to its own reflection. You read for the sluice because you are normal. You ask for directions. You are standard in that finally you favor the tongue harbored between the wide set molars, the sunlight bouncing off of a body shaped like allowance, like the valleys you dare to call your home. Um, this one kind of enca encapsulates the, the whole kind of argument of the book, so I'll read it for that reason. Uh, it's called Next of Kin. The trees have nothing to do with it. The ones standing sentinel in the midst of cornfields. The ones we leave to remind us that at one time we could have been sheltered. I live in a time of competing utopias. There is one wherein the, wherein the seas stay put and one wherein everyone looks like me. I read the New York Times every day. This is how I know this. It tells me a small but growing body of research suggests that multiracial people are more open-minded and creative. Well, consider me a shopping bag repurposed as a hat. I am nowhere near beautiful enough to be a root system. The skin on my heels sloughs off regularly. I walk through the world staring straight at my deteriorating knees. In other words, I am decidedly not the answer to a landscape that we continually destroy in order to feed a relatively small number of people. I am not ice cream nor celery. People don't think enough about rhizomes like lawn grass Aspen, fungi, sort of, which I suppose makes sense as the common root thing is a little on the nose. But how lovely these yellow leaves are. I can't help it. I weep at the sight of them. I want so badly to agree with your study, to remake the world as an embrace in a field. It's called Notes on the Spine, part two. We hinge like puppets until we don't. I call my mother to tell her about a new pain in my knee and she tells me I'm just getting old. That's just the way things are now. She's probably right, but I hear my dad in the background saying, Thelma, don't be a bad mom. <laughs> I pr they're here today. <laughs> I probe my patella on its bed of tendons, my achy hips in their sockets. You're not a bad mom, I say, just a mean one. We laugh. <laughs> The joke is that Asian mothers are blunt like ball peen hammers, precise in their denting, that my frame is now wonky from the repeated blows. Of course, this metaphor makes no sense. Of course, she loves her daughters better than her mother loved her, but that's a joke now too. Bimbi, you got fat. I, on the other hand, have always been told that I would learn to love the legs I thought were too gangly and pale, that I, in some important sense, would form a lovely shape, no risk of me getting called a chink on the soccer field. My mother does not understand my anxieties. This is fair in some ways. After all, I have been given everything this country asks for. I'm sorry your joints hurt, my mother says. You grew too fast. Thank you. Cranbeard was born in North Philly, the youngest of 12 children. He studied and workshops with poets David Ignatow, Kathy Smith Bowers, John Drury, James Dunham, and currently with Lena Gronterich. His poem, Neshemini, pub published in the Schuylkill Valley Journal in 2009, was nominated for Pushcart. His first chapbook, Painting with My Father, has been published by Finishing Line Press uh, in 2019. Um, Dr. Baird conducts a poetry workshop with long-term incarcerated men at Phoenix Prison, formerly Greaterford. 
uh, as part of the Prison Literacy Project of Pennsylvania. Ten poems from five poets from this workshop were published in the fall 2017 Schuylkill Valley Journal. So Phantom Limb. I trashed the bird feeder, scattered the seeds away from the house. As the exterminator predicted, the scratching in the crawl space goes away. The birds return for days, stare up into the air, fly around the empty space like lost migrants, then disappear and don't return. My son calls from his chaos. I am drawn once again to hover around his sadness as if I still could care. This time, when I return home, Something in me is missing. Thank you. Um, so R.G. Evans' books include Over Tipping the Ferryman uh, from Aldrich Poetry Press, uh, The Holy Both from Main Street Rag, and The Noise of Wings, Red Dashboard Press. His debut album of original songs, Sweet Old Life, was released earlier this year and is available on most streaming services. And he also has a website, rgevanswriter.com. Uh, so help me welcome Bob Evans. This is not a poem from Philadelphia Stories, but it is a Philadelphia poem. Almost Holy. My niece is addicting mice to cocaine. The cause is science. The university is temple. So it's almost holy. Mm. Poor little buggers. Their tickers get to ticking, and pretty soon they dream that they are rats that they can fly, that they are rats with wings, mm. pigeons soaring over mouse and rat, the god of mice, of rats, of birds, until morning when they'll believe that they are dead. Then the true god comes in a cloud-like lab coat, the resurrection and the life. I used to dream I was a mouse, but I am only a flea upon a mouse's back, but sometimes, Sometimes the blood's so sweet, I feel I'm the uncle of light, riding bareback and holy through the temple. Mm. Imagine Sisyphus happy. Does he whistle as he sweats and groans the boulder up the mountain? Does he ever think, at least I'm not at home where my daughter wants to die? trembling there at the summit just before the rock rolls down. As he follows it, his mind might wander to the time his daughter screamed, 16 years in this goddamn house with your failed marriage as my roommate. What did she know about what God has damned? Maybe he smokes, letting gravity do its job one step at a time. Eternity is eternity, after all. No room here for a gold-bricking soul. If one can imagine Sisyphus happy, it isn't hard to picture him grinding his lucky strike beneath his toe, cracking his knuckles, and glancing at Tantalus in his lake beneath the trees, bending as the water recedes. And yet, Sisyphus wonders, was that a wink he saw from his damned neighbor when the fruit pulled away out of reach? At least the bastards in the shade, he thinks, and shrugs his flesh into the stone. Mm. Thank you.